Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible.com. Get your free audiobook download and 30-day trial at www.audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. This is Literary Roadhouse. One short story, once a week. I'm Jocelyn. I'm Maya. I'm Gerald. And I'm Kenichi. On today's show, we're discussing Everything That Rises Must Converge by Flannery O'Connor. But first, I must say that Literary Roadhouse is rated PG-13 for occasional potty mouth. If you have preteens and would like to share this show with them, I suggest looking at the iTunes store for our individual episode ratings and pre-listening to the episodes before sharing. We also have a really special guest today. You may remember Jocelyn Johnson's name from the story we read on episode six. She's the author of The Hasselblad. Since Anais is on vacation, we thought Jocelyn would make a great addition to this week's show. Hi, Jocelyn. Hi, Maya. How are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. This is, you, are, you are our very first guest. We have not had a guest yet, so this is really exciting for us, especially since we did read your story. I particularly really enjoyed it and made me really look forward to reading your novel once it gets published. So I'm hoping that that will happen in the near future for you. Thank How you, How about Maya. you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I'm a, I've been writing forever. I'm a teacher. I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm really excited to talk with you guys. I've been listening to the podcast, and it's, I feel like I know you already a little bit. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, we're really happy to have you. And you still came on. <laughs> this week's this week I'm reading a review from MGON. MGON has been a wonderful supporter of our podcast from the very first episode. He says, I'm so glad I caught the inaugural episode of Literary Roadhouse. At the time I came across a link, I was busy but decided what the heck. I clicked it anyway and had no idea what to expect and honestly didn't have high hopes. Just between you and me, I see literary fiction coming and I run the other way. Having said that, truly the show was fun. And interesting for several reasons. The show was hosted by four unique individuals with strong opinions and a desire to dive in and understand the story, freely discussing, questioning, and explaining things, which in turn engages listeners. You'll find yourself questioning, agreeing, disagreeing, and wondering, and gaining understanding. I was determined not to learn anything, but I did. I did learn. The hosts do indeed make literary fiction fun. I know because I pretty much stay clear of literary fiction, yet I truly enjoyed the show. And the fact that I'll be returning next week is proof. Thank you again, MG on, for your great review and all of your support. Jocelyn, why don't you summarize this week's story? All right. I'm going to summarize Everything That Rises Must Converge by Flannery O'Connor. She wrote it in 1965. So it's a story set in the post-integration South in a neighborhood that had been fancy 40 years earlier. Uh, we have Julian, the sullen, depressed son. He's a recent co college graduate, and he's obligated to escort his unnamed widowed mother to her free reducing class at the Y because her doctor says she has to lose weight because of her high blood pressure. At the door, Julian's mother fusses over this new and extremely ugly seven and a half dollar purple hat and whether she can even afford it. Julian, throughout the story, clearly resents his mother. She has this sense of grandeur despite their poverty, and she's she's taken care of him. All she's done all these things for him. But he shares this kind of perverse longing for their lost plantation home, once owned by their grandfather who owned slaves. He has to escort her on the bus because she will no longer ride it at night since it's been integrated. On the bus, her mother commiserates with the other white passengers and cringes when a Negro man enters the bus with his suit and briefcase. Julian wants desperately to teach his mother a lesson about the new world and her place in it. And when a large Negro woman and her young son enter the bus, Julian delights because she has on the same hideous hat as, her, as his mother and the one she's so proud of. But his mother totally laughs it off. She focuses on the child because, of course, she loves Negro children, and Julian and the child's mother are mortified. When all four exit the bus together, Julian insists on offering the child a shiny new penny from her purse. And despite, despite the imminent outrage of the mother and despite Julian's protests, 
Um, when she does this, the Negro mother wants Julian's mom with her pocketbook and sends her sprawling on the sidewalk and then leaves into darkness. At first, Julian's really happy and he takes the opportunity to explain to his mother um, that she deserved it for her condescending penny and that she isn't who she thinks she is. But Julian's glee soon turns to horror when his mother, disoriented, stumbles away from her class at the Y and collapses in an apparent stroke, leaving Julian stricken, stricken and sobbing lovingly for her. That was a really powerful story, and I want to thank you for choosing that for this week's story. Um, who wants to go first? How do you feel about the story? Do you want to go first? You can go first. Go first. Woohoo. Um, yeah, I, to be honest, I, I mean, it was a great story, beautifully written. I love I love the style of it. I love the, um, you know, I like I like the sort of th this sort of story, a factual story or a, a, a non-magical realism story. <laughs> <laughs> we don't like. uh, and and I, I love the, the style of writing. Um, it's simple. It's sparse. Um, but the content of the story made me feel quite uncomfortable um, because uh, I know people like the mother and mm -hmm. um, and I don't know it's 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 hard to 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 sort of face up to the fact that this this is still happening in this this day and age it's um, but but fascinating and, and and really interesting to see the mother in that in that time sort of still being stuck in in you know accepting that that the you know the integration has happened but but then still harboring these you know and, and she said something about you know they they were uh, it was they it was better for them when they were slaves <laughs> and just, <laughs> said, what? okay and and she re truly believes it so so yeah i i really like the story really did you know, it's funny that you called it sparse because that's not the word I would have chosen, but I would have chosen simple. Like some of the language mm. was just elegant and there were some wonderful sentence constructions that I wouldn't necessarily consider sparse, but I would definitely say that there was a simplicity in reading the story that felt really honest. And when Julian was uncomfortable, I felt uncomfortable. When the mom was making a butt of herself, I kind of chuckled. And I, like you, Gerald, I knew people like this. When I was little, um, my, the woman that raised me is white, and she used to house, she was a live-in home care worker for a lady um, when she was fighting to keep me. And this lady was from the South, and her name was Viola. And she was a very Southern lady. <laughs> and she would walk down the halls and chew tobacco and spit it all over the white flowers. And like this lady, she couldn't stand those colored people. Because, you know, you got to whisper <laughs> yeah, yeah. it when you're yeah. in polite company. <laughs> <laughs> you're in the South. You know how, old, how they are. They're, it's like they're being nice, so they got to whisper it. And when I was little, I remember hearing her say, Gladys, why don't you bring that little colored girl over here? Where's your little nigra? <laughs> she loved me to pieces. And I'm like, what is up with racist white ladies that like little <laughs> negro child? Like, I didn't get it. And so when I read that, that she especially, what was the line? It was so wonderful. She especially liked negro children. She found them cuter than white children. I instantly had a flashback to Viola and just started cracking up. And oh I God. really felt these emotions all the way through the story. And to me, that was a sign of real craft. You know, if I can feel embarrassed for the characters that I'm reading and then go from embarrassment to sadness to interest to laughter, that's just like a story that's, you know, deep to me. I don't mind being uncomfortable. You know, mm. I like discomfort in my stories. And it was just wonderful how raw those emotions felt for me as I was reading it. And, and that's strange, isn't it? Because because obviously Flannery O'Connor was white. And so she's she's writing a story that that resonates with you as a, as a black person and, and that's that's a true you know true gifted talent isn't it well i think really what it is how many stories do we read around this content but they're always from the black point of view mm -hmm. and it is refreshing to read about race from the white point of view because so many people everyone thinks about it but 
quote unquote, air quotes, good people don't talk about it. Black people talk about race all the time. Y'all don't realize we talk about race all <laughs> the time. But <laughs> you guys are so darn polite, you don't want to say anything. And so when I read this and I'm able to see the generation shifts between like someone that's modern and they're looking at their parent and it's embarrassing and wanting them to get with the program and that kind of juxtaposition it's just wonderful to me because it was so honest and it's an honesty that I don't get to see very often in stories or anything else for that matter. Well, I, I've i read a lot of Flannery O'Connor stories. I hadn't read this one before and that's like kind of her place to be with like kind of white, uh, racist, very conflicted characters. And I think um, this story definitely did that. So I'm kind of used to the discomfort and that kind of queasy feeling of, being like so intimately in the heads of these characters. But I, I have never read a story before that kind of had that, this was in a later collection of hers. So you have this son who is seeing the future. You know, I think of it like now with like um, LBGT kind of issues, that same thing where you have younger generation who's a lot more just tolerant than maybe their parents are. And I definitely, um, I like this story too. I had some problems with it but I really liked it and I was kind of really impressed with the story like it was such a simple story but it did so many things there's this really dark humor and like so much irony in the story within these characters so I really like that yeah how about you Kaneshi how did you feel about the story yeah um I'm gonna go against the grain and say <laughs> I, I, I didn't like the story at all like I didn't like it one I bit. love it when you do that for us <laughs> thank you Kaneshi <laughs> I wasn't impressed in the slightest. I mean, even I don't like <laughs> of the stories that we've read. This is by far the one that just didn't grip me at all. And I mean, I didn't. I think especially as because last time we read um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and I think that story in particular, the language and the way it flowed just really like clicked with me. Whereas this, I didn't find myself reading it as easily as I read that story. I found it kind of. I don't know. I, I guess for me. Personally, I can read certain authors easier than others, and this was not a um, smooth read for me. And then just the content of the story, I didn't like it at all, and I didn't like any of the characters. I didn't like the woman, I didn't like the guy, I didn't like <laughs> anyone in the story, to be honest. <laughs> You're like, they're all just okay. a bunch of pains in the butts, and they can go away. <laughs> I mean, the, the issue I had with the, um, the guy in the story, Julian, it's kind of this thing of when... Um, I can't, not I can't, but I don't like it when people, not people, but like characters are supposed to get praised for doing something that should be the norm anyway, you know? So, and it's like, even his attitude as well was kind of like, oh, I want to make a black friend to prove my, um, to prove my mother wrong. And to me, that's just like, that's just so belittling, like, you know? Mm -hmm. What? Well, I, I definitely think like in this story, Julian is not a good person. <laughs> I mean, I don't think no. within the story... He is, you know, I mean, he, he does. He wants to make a black friend to kind of impress his mother. And yet he, when the woman sits next to him, he's uncomfortable. Like he doesn't really want to do it. He doesn't want to go to the sit-in and actually do something he can do. He kind of wants to make, he's kind of obsessed with her really in the story as far as kind of making this point. But he doesn't really uh, want to do what's right. I don't think that's his motivation. No, and what I see in him is the reason why, see, I don't need to like my characters. Give me a bunch of characters that I dislike that I can get into their heads. And to me, sometimes that's even more fascinating than having a bunch of characters I actually like. I did not like Julian, but I understood Julian. And I felt like some of his frustrations and the way he acted out were kind of universal. Um, you know, when you've got a parent and you're, I mean, this kid's fresh out of college. You know, I can remember being back to like 20 years old and being mad at mom and I'm going to go to Hawaii and then not calling her and letting her worry because I was just so pissed off at her, you know. And it, it just stupid shit because I was like 20 and she was just on my last nerve. And I can see, I can see that in him. And it was really honest. But at the same time, it was like a fantasy. Like he's fantasizing about all these things because he's been under this woman's thumb. And if you've ever had a mom who is constantly like every word out of her mouth is everything I've done, I've done for you. You have to live up to all these things because I've sacrificed my entire life for you. That gets really grating super quick. 
So, like, all of this stuff that he's doing is in reaction to always having to live up to these expectations and being smart enough to recognize he's never going to live up to these expectations. He's never going to have, like, an awesome job or be a super successful person. And his mother is, like, delusional about it. And that's a lot of pressure. But at the same time, when the comeuppance comes, that's not what he really wanted. You know, he's really upset when she's injured and it's like horrifying and there's guilt and there's fear and everything else in there. And so what I liked about him is the fact that it was honest and it didn't apologize for the honesty. Like she could have like given him an out to make him like a redemptive character. But I think that would have like taken away from the strength of the story in my opinion. And, and and also, I th- I think it's it's fairly typical because he was trying too hard. He was he was saying, "Hey, we're integrated, so we've got to be friends with these people," and and desperate to to show that he was friendly to all these coloured people. And um, so he he was sort of in in a way overreacting against his mother's um, his his mother's sort of st- st- stayed responses and and uh, and outdated ideas uh, and i suspect that happens a lot when it whenever somebody whenever something different comes along and 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 we as a society say okay you now have to you know not treat these people like outcasts um like jocelyn said you know lgbt um lbgt things now um that people sometimes go over the top in trying to say i'm a friend of these people and um <laughs> and, and and it just i have a black friend yeah yeah <laughs> and, and as, Kine- as Kinechi said it, it's it's not the right thing to do you should just you know you shouldn't say you shouldn't have to try to be nice to people it, it just treat them as people yeah and and in some ways i wonder if if his desire to to be modern was more in a reaction to the desire to not be what his mother wanted. Mm. Like if his mother had been pro black people and like pro suffrages, he may have grown up a raging racist. And I've known kids like that, that are just anything to be oppositional to their parent. But then when push comes to shove, they really do love their parent. In most cases, they're oppositional until like mid to late 20s. Then they have kids and they realize mom was right. And then they come back to the fold when they grow up. (laughs) But, you know, sometimes that doesn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) What is it? I hate you. I hate you. Oh, never mind. (laughs) (laughs) What? I I love his like fantasies. Like maybe my mom will be dying and I can just only find a a black doctor to save her or maybe I can have a girlfriend <laughs> that's very well educated that I can bring over. I mean, you know, he's it's it's pretty humorous. It was humorous. But I have to say I understand what Kenechi said about um the difficulty reading because when I first tried to read it and I a lot of times this happens and so I kind of chalk it up to my ADD where when I read something that's very musical that has a lot of poetry in it, it's easier for me to read it in my head. Whereas when I read the story, I read the first page, I was like, mm, this isn't working for me. And I actually read it out loud. And I felt like this, this is very much like a spoken story that you would read at like a fire. Like it's hard for me to read the story in my head silently. I read and, this out loud too. And I wonder what that is. I, there isn't a rhythm to the story. You know, like a lot of times when you're reading stuff, it doesn't necessarily have to be iambic, but there's like a rhythm in the sentences. This story doesn't have a rhythm. Hmm. At least not to me. And I'm wondering if maybe that's why Kenechi was having such a hard time with it. Because the stories that, like last week, last week's story was very musical. Like, you know, um, Garcia Marquez, his writing was very lyrical. And I think sometimes the musicality of language makes it easier to like you know get into it and get lulled into the hypnotism of the story and whereas when you're reading a story that doesn't necessarily have that you have to work a little harder to get into it what do you guys think I don't know if this is the exact same thing but for me the thing I liked about the story was also something I had a problem with which was I was really conscious of what Flannery O'Connor was doing everything felt 
super meaningful. There wasn't kind of this just natural, this was incidental and you're going to get what you get from it. I definitely think she had a point and a point of view that was in sometimes a little over heavy handedly hammered in. There were some it moments. It felt crafted. Where, yeah, I could, but I could, and maybe it's because I'm a writer and also I'm, I've read her before and I'm reading it to talk about it. So I'm thinking about what she's doing. So that definitely adds to it, but I could feel some of the moments which took me out of the story just a little bit here and there. How about you, Kanechi? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it does have something to do with the reason why I didn't like it. Because for me, it just didn't flow. And I mean, I'm not sure exactly why that is. It might just be the language that was used, but it really didn't flow for me. And um, as we were talking, I just, there was another thing I had an issue with was um, the... I don't want to say the ending, but the presentation of the black woman, it's like, I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but it's her character ended up being violent. And I hate when I see things like that. Like you have like a minor, minority character in something. And despite the fact that it's trying to portray them in a positive light, ultimately ends up portraying them in a negative light. So like at the end of the story, this woman ends up having a stroke because the woman like, I don't know, clocked her across the face with her, um, her notebook. And I was just like, I didn't see that coming, but at the same time, it's kind of like, oh, well, you know, I'm writing this story about um, how black people are, you know, they're good as well. But then, you know, despite the fact I'm doing that, there's still this stereotype of aggression, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, see, I didn't see her as being portrayed as um, a good person. Um, you know, I saw her being portrayed as frustrated and angry and just really not wanting anything to do with white people and so when she fought back I it didn't jar me the same way that I understand what you mean because I've read stories like that and it can really get on my nerve you know the whole angry black woman thing so not cool but for some reason in the story it didn't bother me because none of the characters were likable like all the characters were equally (laughs) ugly And it made it easier for me to take. I think the only character in this story that wasn't ugly was the little boy. Yeah, I agree with you there. Mm. Now, even the man with the briefcase, he wasn't compassionate or he was grumbly. Like, everybody was just irritable. And so it didn't bother me as much. How about you, uh, Gerald? Yeah, I I think, I mean, she was, she, the, the violence came at the end, but she was she was not a sympathetic character um oh. and she wasn't pain- and none of them were, were painted very very sympathetically um and and i get the feeling that that the reaction of of the black people in the story sort of made me think that that they they don't like Kenechi says you know you shouldn't need to try you shouldn't need to move to sit near to me you shouldn't need to engage me in conversation um and and you know, maybe there's 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 a suspicion from the black people um, of the white people doing that, um, and it was written. I mean, it was it was. I don't know what year it was written in, but it was it was. It was in the sixties, right? Was it? Sixty five was when it was published. It was, it was published, published in nineteen sixty five. Yeah. Yeah. She, yeah. It, and I was dealing with Viola in the eighties. Yeah. Okay, straight up. Um, you know, I gotta say, it's hard for me because I get sick and tired of stories that pander where you're the good people and you're the bad people and everyone's too afraid to portray black people as, you know, having any kind of negative emotion for fear that the author's going to be labeled as racist. But then if you make them have negative emotion, then you're stereotyping. I think that is a hard line to roll when you are a non-minority writer. And I felt the choice to make none of the characters especially sympathetic was a smart one that made it more palpable. I think and had she made the black woman like an angel, that would have been just as irritating. I would have been all like, okay, the help. You know, yeah. that's that's that problem where all the white people are e- evil. And then there's like this one sweet black woman who's so put upon and that gets old, too. So it's just a really hard line to roll 
and she was she was approaching this in the 60s i feel like it was a really brave choice i think a lot of writers nowadays would have taken the safe route on the story on a story like this i don't think they would have been as brave well one thing i really like about the woman the woman who i can see kind of the stereotypical thing going with her but they were a mirror of each other the mother and this woman they had the same hat on they both had all this pride the woman i think O'Connor O'Connor describes her as like someone who's had all this pressure put upon her and it's like one pound too much this penny that her child's going to get and so I think the fact that they were both in a way despicable or whatever excused that moment of violence or it didn't make it seem I believed it within the story also I think the problem one of the problems I had with the story that was that self-consciousness but it kind of in a way mirrors this moment everyone who gets on this bus is so self-conscious they have to look for where they can sit and what it means and how they can hide behind their paper because they know they're hated or and the only person who isn't is the child and even he is kind of just a pawn to this thing because he's looking at this white woman who thinks he's a cute nigger child and I mean it's just so awkward and uncomfortable for everybody I, th- I think she, she, the fact that she gave both women the same hat, is is <laughs> is the th- she's she's what she's telling us is these two people are different colors, but they are the same people. They are the same character. Um, They're mirrors. Yeah, yeah. One thing that I sh- that I feel like is important, but I haven't yet put words to it. Why? And then maybe you guys have some thoughts on this. At several points in the story, there was questions about class and where culture comes from, whether culture is in the mind, whether culture is in the actions, whether culture is just who you are. And I feel like those are really important questions socially, and it was approached in a really interesting way in this story that doesn't come to any kinds of conclusions. At least I didn't feel like it came to any kind of conclusions. How did you guys feel about that or explore that as you were reading this? Yeah, she she was. I mean, this the 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 mother. She was obviously reminding the boy of how things used to be, um, and they used to have plantations, and they used to be, you know, uh, uh, used they used to be the governor of the state or or something. And so she obviously thinks that she still has that sort of class status. Um, of those times and and maybe she you know, maybe she's having a tough time dealing with not only the fact that that there's there's integration now but there's also their falling status from from being powerful and uh, uh, you know basically ruling over the the, the area and, and being in charge um, to, to just having a this little apartment uh, the same as everyone else you know maybe she was having trouble with that well i i love that story i thought that was like the big question of the of the short story what makes you who you are and the mom keeps saying you know kind of referring back to the history they have to her race that she knows what to do and she feels like she's comfortable everywhere whereas the son he's kind of having this existential crisis he's in his mind he feels like he has to create who he is and he's comfortable nowhere and in the story, I love how she doesn't offer an answer to who you are, but she does have this moment at the end where um, the son looks at the mom and says, he looks into a face he's never seen before, and the, son, and the mother looks at him and says, it's, um, she's trying to determine his identity. So there's this definite moment of who are they going to become? Who are these people going to become in the future? And they both long for the slave house. I love that. They both long, maybe the son even more, as much as he claims to be not racist, he wants that grand house that he's only set foot in once he dreams about it. And I, I thought that was really interesting. You know, um, when you talked about that last part where he's looking at her and trying to figure out, you know, who she is, you know, when I go back earlier into the story, he says, uh, where is it? Restored to my class, he muttered, he thrust his face toward her and hissed true culture is in the mind the mind and then later he repeats it three times and then she comes back with it's in the heart and it's how you do things and how you do things is because of who you are and his belief that the culture and who you are comes from the mind really 
was a gut punch at the end because it's her mind that's affected. If mm. you believe that the who she is is in her mind and she loses her mind, he's lost his mother. And that was so just wow to me. Absolutely wowed me because it was perfectly reflected. And I noted it when I read through the first time, I was like, he repeated that three times. That is important. And then to have that reflected back at the end was very emotional for me. And and not just because of how my mom died, but just, you know, having that core belief of your paradigm of what makes a person their who they are and then have that ripped away from, like, the one person who did sacrifice for you and who you've been irritated with for all these years ha- was very emotional and beautifully done. How about you, Kanechi? Do you have any thoughts on that? Um... On aside the from classes. the fact that you hate it. <laughs> Sorry, say that again. <laughs> I said aside from the fact that you hate it. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, I didn't really think too much about the class issue. But then now that um, we're talking about it, it's interesting that she decided to write it, like to write about class. But then she, all the characters all get on the same bus. So it's like there isn't any variation in class with the characters in the story. I mean, yes, there's that variation between ethnicity and race and, like, their backgrounds and stuff, but they're all still getting the bus. Like, they're not getting, I don't know, they're not driving or they're all still paying the same fare and getting on the same bus. So it's, like, it's interesting that she decided to do it that way. Um, but I guess that's probably because she wanted to illustrate the... Um, she, maybe she wanted to emphasise the racial aspect more than the class aspect, per se. I think also, coming from the UK class point, you guys have working class as an identity in the UK that is not necessarily as stagnant as it is here. So like I've heard people from the UK say they're working class, even though they're no longer working class, they're working class because that's how they were raised. That's how their parents were raised here. Class is, is much more. A lot of times it is racially based. You can have poor people and you'll have poor people of different classes. (laughs) You know, because like, you know, some people get more of whatever than other people, but it's not something that is static. It changes like there's a lot of change in class. And if you're on the bus, you will see rich people on the bus. Well, not rich people, but like upper middle class people on the bus, as well as poor people on the bus and everyone in between, at least where I'm at, you'll see all of that on the bus, Um, especially, you know, when you're talking about commuter buses or whatever. And you're talking about the 60s, you know, I, this to, that to me struck me as very American as I was reading it. How about you, Jocelyn? Do you feel like that was an Americanism? I don't know. I'm just thinking about now with class in America. I think everyone thinks they're going to be rich. I mean, I think in America, everyone kind of. We're just realizing that nobody's (laughs) rich except for a very few. Exactly. But there's this kind of fantasy or this idea that Mm -hmm. inevitably I will be rich. So I think there is this kind of fluid idea of class, and it probably was true then. But in the story, one thing I really like about what she did with class was that idea of um, kind of lost grandeur. Like she keeps talking about St. Sebastian and Rome. Rome wasn't built in a day. And this idea of kind of when I think of Rome, I just think of like something that got this too big and too grand and it just totally collapsed under its own horrible weight. And that's kind of slavery there again. I don't know. I just... I it's thought- it's weird here. I'm I'm in Northern California, and our middle class are not actually middle class. Like what we consider middle class is it's weird. Like they're one paycheck and they'll be poor, and they're quote unquote middle class, and they have you know they're on the good side of town or whatever. Like we don't our our classes just aren't as noticeable as the people that I've talked to from the UK. Hmm. I think that's quite interesting. I, I've had this discussion with, with people um, about class because I I say that I'm working class. I I'm and and people will say to me, no, you know, you 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 retired early. You've got a comfortable life. I said, no, for for me, class is is in my head. It, it's 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 cultural, and and no matter how much you you can be rich as you know any anything. J.K. Rowling. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, that's probably quite a good example. You know, she yeah, she's, she's stinking rich, but yeah, she's still, you know, in touch with with her working class roots. 
which is uh, which I think is good. I, I, I think I, it's interesting that like even your accents and things change based on class, and we don't like our filthy rich people. They sound a little funny, but that's just because they travel a lot. Like our middle class so people have the same accent for the most part as poor people, as long as they're in the same racial demographic. <laughs> mm. I, I just wanted to come back. Um, there's an interesting point you said when you sh you said that she steered away from from treating the the black woman kindly, um, and and it was interesting. I, I had a discussion with um, a, a writer, a uh, crime writer, Sophie Hanna, who uh, she was talking about um, the villains in in her writing, and I said that I find difficulty creating bad female characters because I feel that I'm stereotyping them and she said bad characters are bad characters they can they can be yeah. either and I, and I think that's that's sort of the, the same here you know she Flannery O'Connor has, has, has treated all the people the same um, and she's not been kind to to one side or the other so aside from the issues with feeling like um, the black woman was really negative and the issues with the lyricalism, lyricism, I'm like, what is that word? How would I pronounce it? Of the story. Did anyone else have any conflicting feelings about anything in particular with the story? One thing I really didn't like in the story, and it's just a small thing, was the Flannery O'Connor chose to show us the black woman's purple hat before either Julian or his mother noticed it. She describes it very specifically with the green, like exactly as she had at the beginning. So we are obviously aware of the hat. And I just was curious, like she's it's so crafted. Why did she choose not to have Julian or his mother? Why didn't we see it through their eyes? We're really with Julian and he's seeing everything else in the story. And I think the same was true with the stroke. I really saw the stroke coming. I mean, it's there in the first sentence of the, of the, or the first paragraph of the story, you know, the high blood pressure, but that's great. You know, that's foreshadowing, but there's a moment where I thought, oh, this mom's gonna, you know, he talks about her florid face and her blood pressure is going to go to 300. And I'm like, I know what's, I know she's, she's going yeah, there down. Was even a point I knew where she was he, going down. Didn't he say something like, um, he, he hopes her blood pressure goes up, but not up too high because she can't have a stroke. Like it, it's like explicitly said in the story. And yeah, it gave me a hiccup when I read it too. I was like, really? You didn't have to like be so heavy handed. Yeah. I mean, we, I think it would have been for me a little bit more satisfying in the end if I hadn't literally had that thought oh you know kind of midway kind of page six of ten kind of thing yeah so it's it's because you're it's it's because you're a writer you're you're sort of you're you're seeing the clues before 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 you should do you know um, that that's interesting because like like Kenechi said last week's story very well could be affecting how he's seeing this week's story you know our perspectives are definitely at least partially influenced by the fact that we're writers but yet at the same time there were i what was it i was just listening to a podcast a saturday show and they were going over the laughing man and they spotted themes that i we totally didn't get actually Kenechi, i need to talk to you because you were right um but <laughs> yeah yeah at one point he was like did she get pregnant or something and, and yeah she did and there was an abortion and we none of us saw it except Kenechi. <laughs> you know, and I was like, oh man. But yeah, the fact that we're writers definitely does influence how we see the story. I think it makes us more critical of the story. And I think it makes it so that when we like a story, it's even more likable. Like, how would you say that? You know, if you're being super critical of something and then you like it, it seems to have more importance because of the fact that you're being super critical about it, you know? And I do feel like we are that way, and I think that's a good thing. I definitely felt like the story was crafted. There was that moment about the stroke that I definitely felt was a little heavy-handed. Um, and I felt like the opening paragraph didn't pull me in right away. You know, I definitely had to read it out loud. I had to read it a couple times. It didn't suck me in right away. But the story seemed to have a really slow, plotting growth that was very um, crafted. And I'm realizing I like crafted stories. 
I like lyrical stories that flow, but a lot of times with those stories, I see a lot of stuff that can be cut and it irritates me. I do enjoy these stories where every word seems to have a point, seems to have like um, deeper meaning to it. And I felt like this was definitely a crafted story, but there were those two things that really bothered me. Anyone else have anything that bothered them about the story? Um, there was one paragraph that really threw me, and I had to read it quite a few times because it just, when I read it, I just got so confused. It was when, um, what did she say? She goes, um, this hat looked better on me than any of the others. So yes, I had to read it she, twice too. I was like, is it, are we suddenly in first person now? What is going on? And I had to read it so many times before I realized, I don't know, she didn't, she kind of just threw us in there and like the whole, um, the tense just changed the whole, um, like she went from yeah, third person to first person. Yeah, she was quoting what the salesperson mm. oh, right. said. Oh, yeah. right. And I had to read it out loud because I totally, yeah. I totally got confused by that sentence too. And that's not a good thing. And it seems like she did that maybe to give us that line, you won't see yourself coming and going, kind of the irony that we're going to see that hat again. But it, I, yeah. I thought that was awkward too, actually. But if it's clumsy and it loses the reader, then yeah, she's going to get docked some points for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> she's Ooh. not going to like that. <laughs> <laughs> We're just so picky over here. <laughs> oh, I thought it was Is so any... funny when you guys uh, read my story and then it's like before that it was like Juno Diaz and like all these like extremely accomplished writers. And it was it was kind of fun to hear that your same level of kind of criticism, really. <laughs> and Truly, every story kind of, you know, gets to that level. What do you see? What do you like? What's working and what's not, regardless? Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how we're reading stories after a year of this. Because mm. I'm already finding how I read stories is changing because of the podcast in a really positive way. And um, I'm very curious to see. Because you're right, we, we tend to pick all of the stories apart. You know, we got our first bad review because somebody that really likes Hemingway didn't... Um, like Anna Yusa's review last week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, look, every story, no stories are perfect. It's very hard to get mm -hmm. a perfect story. <laughs> and we're, and you bring yourself to the story. I mean, I think that yeah. is what's really nice about having the four of you and like Kamichi, you're like the outlier there. You're always zagging, which I really appreciate. But just that kind of, and the magical realism thing, Gerald, like just seeing that kind of what you bring to the story. It's, it's incomplete without the reader. Yeah. And this is especially interesting, you know, with a story that is so, such an American story, hearing the comments from people that are not American and how they're seeing the story, I'm finding really interesting. Do any of you have any other comments about the story before we move on to the ratings? Nope. Covered my points. How about you, Kanachi? Um, no, I, I don't have anything else to say. No. Okay, then let's <laughs> Probably just rate as well. this puppy. <laughs> you want to go first, Jocelyn, since you're our guest, our sure. very first guest? I will go first. Um, I'm going to give this story four, four and a third Brad Bears. No, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh. You got to go with halves, man. I'll go I can't half. have my four calculator breaking. <laughs> four I will go four and a half. <laughs> and how about you, Kenechi? I'm gonna give this story one Brad Berry. Whoa! <laughs> that's just because so... I just didn't like it at all. But then, as we as we were talking, there were things that kind of um that became clearer to me. So I guess he gets one. I didn't want to give it zero. Were you actually <laughs> contemplating giving it zero? Is that what I'm hearing from you? I don't think so. Yeah. Wow, that's deep, dude. <laughs> It's just simply because there was nothing about the story that I liked. There, was, there wasn't a single thing that I could say, oh, I liked it about this story. So it was just kind of like, I wouldn't have read it. You know, I mean, if we weren't reading it for this, I would have read like the first two paragraphs. And the thing is, because before I read the story, I didn't know um, what year the story was setting on and what it was about. And so I was reading it and then certain words were just like catching me. And I was like, wait, hold on a minute, hold on a minute. Because like the first part, <laughs> Did they like, just oh, say Negro? Yeah, exactly. So I, was, <laughs> I was like, what is this? <laughs> Negro, please. Because the first thing I noticed is when it was, um, she she doesn't like riding the bus because, because it's um, integrated. And I was like, huh? And then, so I kept reading it. And I was like, okay, this is what the story is about. But then it was just kind of like, 
if I didn't know that, I would have just stopped reading at that point because I was like, well, I'm not really interested in this, you know? So that's why I, it just didn't do anything for me in the story. So I have to go with one. Okay. <laughs> Actually, that's, that's quite interesting because because I'm I'm older than Kanechi, so I, I, I have some, uh, perhaps a bit more sort of knowledge of, of that time. And also I wrote the author Spotlight. So I, I was sort of grounded in the time and the place. And uh, so it... I was yes, yeah, so I, I I was straight in with the story because I I knew where it was from and and what it was writing. Yeah, I'll 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 go. Oh jeez, I'll go. I suppose I have to go four. I four. It was well written. Um, I I liked I liked the the conflict between the 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 black and the white characters and and the son who was sort of stuck in the middle. Um, so yeah, uh, it's a four. Yeah, four for Gerald. So what am I gonna give it? You know, I was really torn on what to give it because literally the only things wrong with it are just those couple things that I said, and I really enjoy the story, and so Did I'm gonna give the you, story though? a five. What? Did it move you? It it did actually. It I, really because did. of your experience, yeah. I think because not only just because of my experience, but I've read a lot of fiction that is over through generations. Like I've read a lot of older fiction and I was raised by older people. So I felt like, like a lot of times I'll re when I started reading this, I didn't know anything about the story either. I just started reading it. And within minutes I was able to place the time by the language. And so um, I'm going to give it a five. I'm going to give it a really good, solid five. Because I did enjoy it quite a bit. But again, it wasn't perfect. It still had a couple of hiccups. And so I can't really give it a six at this point. But it was, I, it was good. It was really good. And it's definitely an author that I'm going to come back to in the future. Um, for last week's Bradbury's ratings, we had... Only two people leave Bradbury's. People, you know, come on now. Come on now. We, we need more Bradbury's. <laughs> Give my calculator a workout here. Um, our listeners gave five and a half Bradbury's for the story last week, which was the handsomest drowned man in the world. I have something really special to announce. For listeners of Literary Roadhouse, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with their 30-day free trial to give you an opportunity to check out the service. Now, I have been an Audible listener since 2008, and I thought this would be a great opportunity to help both our listeners while also supporting the podcast. Right now, I just finished Neil Gaiman's The Ocean at the End of the Lane. I finished it last night, and it was read by Neil Gaiman beautifully. Um, I've only read a couple of Neil Gaiman's works, and I felt like this was a, the story that was closest to literary fiction and something that is most definitely going to go down as a classic right along with The Golden Compass, Alice in Wonderland, and all those wonderful stories in the future. In order to get your own copy, uh, your own free copy, I encourage you to download your free audiobook today at www.audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash literary roadhouse for your free audiobook. Now we're going to play the game. Ooh. Exciting. Uh -oh. So, <laughs> what stories are we submitting? I know that Jocelyn is going to be submitting Anais's story for her. Yeah, so Anais chose Ray Bradbury's The Velt. I think that's how you say it. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, Kenechi? Yeah, I'm going to submit um, Tony Takitani by Haruki Murakami. Ooh. Oh, Gerald, I'm sorry. Well, why are you sorry? <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. Okay. I, maybe you'll I'm, like I'm, another one. Yeah, maybe. Um, I'm going. I'm going old school with um, the Man of the Crowd by Edgar Allan Poe. Ooh, we've got some really oh. good options this week. Okay, mm. we're gonna go across, and what you're going to do is you're going to tell me one of Shakespeare's plays. Oh God! Each one of you alternately until somebody misses one. So let's start. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
with Jocelyn. Let's start with Jocelyn since she's our guest. All right. Um, I'm going to start with Romeo and Juliet. Uh, low hanging fruit. One's gone. Let's get it done. Okay, yeah. Gerald. Um, Hit me. Macbeth. Um, King Lear. Okay, I'm going to go Hamlet. Gerald? Um, Midsummer Night's Dream. Othello. Um, <laughs> um, I'm going to go with... I can't be stumped already. I think <laughs> I might be stumped. No, you got this. You got this. Do, 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 uh, do, 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 do. <laughs> that song is not Sorry. healthy. <laughs> That's okay. You're All right, out? I'm out. I'm oh. out. Sorry, Anise. <laughs> okay. Gerald. No looking at bookcases. This is no, <laughs> it's, it's no good. Cause <laughs> he is looking, it's, looking it's, around. It's, it's, looking around no, makes me suspicious. <laughs> it's this, no, I can assure you there's nothing up there by Shakespeare. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, right, um, oh, crikey. I'm going to be... Oh, come on. You've life. only given me six already. He's written so many plays. Tragedies, comedies, histories. Um, uh, I'm under pressure. That's why I can't think of anything. <laughs> <clears throat> it's like me when she was all invisible man and I was like, what are you talking about? He wasn't white. <laughs> it was Ralph <laughs> Found it. There's two of them. <laughs> I like Gerald's game where you just had to guess the color. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Okay, Gerald, I'm going to have to give you five nice. seconds. Come on now. Uh, um, no, no. But it, I'm, I've, gone bl I've gone blank. You're so. out? Yeah. <laughs> okay, Kanechi, give me one more. Julius Caesar. Bing, 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 bing. So what story are we reading next week? Tony Takatani by Haruki Murakami. Jocelyn, I really want to thank you for such a wonderful addition to our episode this week. It was really fun having you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm so glad I could and be here. And if people want to learn more about your fiction or talk to you online, where's the best place to reach you? Yeah, they can go to my blog, which is called Jocelyn Stories. And it's just my first and last name, JocelynJohnson.com. And they can shoot me an email from there if they'd like. To join the discussion, visit literaryrighthouse.com. While you're at it, please leave an iTunes review and tell us which episode is your favourite. Your reviews encourage us and help others find our podcast. Don't forget to tell your friends, and until next time, read a good story. story.